Oh, look, it's Friday on Bring It In Troops, little Zoom from Quarantine Show. David's here and there's Gerard. How's everybody doing? Good, good, good. good. We're feisty. Judy's clock is here. We're very feisty. <laughs> feisty, it's a punchy day. Um, okay, I guess we jump right in. Gerard, you're the man of the hour. Let's do this. Indeed. So I want to look at the many faces of Coach Draymond Green. Judy, go ahead and run that through. Knicks are going to make you work. And defensively, they've been very good. That's a nice steal by Nerland's Noel. He got another technical foul. If it's on Draymond, he's ejected. But that was last night's game where Draymond, Draymond got ejected. Um, coming down the court, he was yelling at James Wiseman um, for being in an incorrect spot on, on setting up, on, on, you know, sealing off his man. And, you know, that led to Draymond getting attacked and getting tossed. Okay. Base number. Either way, that second one was Draymond uh, talking to Wiseman. He wasn't playing in that particular there, game. Just jump up. Oh, you just jump. Oh, okay. Don't worry. You close an F and you're one step up. And then yeah, in, the third one, video. in the third one uh, that, uh, that I had there, he wasn't. There wasn't audio there, but you could see him sort of like in a more encouraging, like patting him on the chest, like here's what we need to do, blah, blah, blah. So as a coach, sometimes we're annoyed and we <laughs> can annoy to talk. Sometimes it's like, it's okay, buddy. Here's what you need to do better. And other times it's like, well, you know, there's all these different, there's teaching moments. Like, all right, I need you to move your body here and do this thing. I said at the beginning of the season, having Draymond would be very helpful for James Wiseman. And I think it's true. As good as Kerr and Collins and all those people are, in-game help from someone as smart as Draymond is good for his development, particularly because there was no summer camp, summer league and he played three college games. Right. I mean, you're right. Well, let's, let's pick up on that. Make a note, Henry, Mr. Abbott. Make a note. All right. So uh, Jalen, you know, President Biden is now in office and Jalen Brown, uh, I don't remember if it was a tweet. Uh, yeah. Well, so he, he had a statement. Um, my dilemma was never with any presidencies or selections of different faces. It's more about the system, I think, that needs to be changed. I definitely think a lot of people feel at ease knowing that there's a different president that's going to be representing our country going forward. I know there was a lot of stress attached to our former president, potentially, but I definitely want to keep the same energy up in terms of having the awareness and pushing forwards for change. And he goes on about that. And it's just really smart. Uh, uh, the, the, you, there's already lots of calls and we hear them now. Unity, 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 it, no. The aggrieved parties are not the ones that need to make sure there's unity. There needs to be justice and change, reformation, right? This is, this is a time-honored tradition in life, typically. You don't just get beat up and then make amends. Well, I wanna make sure I don't get beat up again. The making amends part doesn't guarantee me of anything. So I, I feel like if you look at the history of the NBA, and I've been following the NBA for a long time, we, uh, we don't always have men like Jalen Brown in, in positions of, of authority where they, they speak and we listen. When we do, we're fortunate. And so the league's got a few people like Jalen. Uh, I'm just glad that we do. And uh, I think we're, we got to keep listening to what he has to write and say. Jalen Brown, leader of the revolution and maybe best player on the Celtics. <gasps> maybe. Oh, hey, oh, we got God. God. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, a uh, little tidbit from Twitter where uh, NBA players, the Players Association, talking about wanting equity in teams. Um, of course, everybody like had ridiculous uh, responses to this because that's what we do. But um, my thought is like this makes NBA players just like startup employees, right? These are businesses where the revenue is uncertain, but the big payoff comes from an acquisition or some kind of event of going public or whatever. So. Um, and we see it now, right? Like, so they, the union has been very effective over the last 50 years in getting them 50 odd percent of revenue and then 0% of equity, right? So it seems like a little better mix will be better. And people will, will tell you that um, there are uh, conflicts of interest that will make it so you couldn't do so. You don't want LeBron owning the Lakers or, you know, or et cetera. I think there are probably many creative ways to solve that if everybody wants to. Um, my first thought being a journalism major is just have like a mutual fund. Um, they do this with the marketing dollars now. So like you sell a bunch of jerseys all over China, all the money goes into a pot, the player association distributes it to the players according to their value, it's calculated in some way. 
you could basically have 10% of a player's contract is in this fund and the fund owns a 10% of every team. Something like this would work and without conflict of interest. Um, also, people will say, are the players ready for the cash calls to come where investors have to write checks? And the answer is probably after a few years of building up a little revenue. Yeah. Um, anyway, there you go. We can talk about that later. Love that, Henry. Let's talk more about that. Uh, so everyone knows the acronym CAA. They are the Creative Artist Agency, and they represent likely your favorite movie star, likely one of your favorite entertainment folks. They also represent your now current president and vice president of the United States. That is correct. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are CAA clients. Now, on its surface, okay, no big deal, whatever. Um, but, you know, CAA's public face is, all right, we're this big agency that connects all this talent worldwide. But there's something else going on mysteriously with this cabal. And what we're seeing here is this sort of like consolidation, right, of power that's happening among these large corporations. And with people like politicians getting in, involved in, into bed with CAA, I mean, what does that tell us? One, what is a general election if not a popularity contest. That's how you win elections, right? Is by being popular. And, you know, that's Bill Clinton going on the Arsenio Hall show playing the saxophone. That is Donald Trump being the host of a very popular show, whether you watch it or not, The Apprentice, right? That's Barack Obama hanging out with Jay-Z and people like that. That's why The Rock and Oprah Winfrey, if they ever wanted to run for president, would likely win because they're immensely popular. So the more and more our politicians get involved in things like this, right, in increasing their Q rating, what does that mean for us, the citizenry of America? Seems like we need more than 90 seconds on that one, Gerard. Right. <laughs> exactly. uh, Dr. Fauci, uh, Fauci was uh, speaking nicely. It was nice to see, hear and see him speak again at a press conference, and I guess that'll be happening a lot. And he basically admitted that uh, it's been hard. It's been hard to sit back and watch the, you know, the lies. That the, he, he didn't say the word lies, but... The, the lack of truth and lack of transparency. And he was speaking relating to COVID issues with, with President Trump. But I, I just want to remind you that uh, our former president lied about everything, it, not just COVID. It, it, that may have been the most devastating of the lies in terms of 400,000 plus people dead and another 100,000 or so are coming before we get a handle of this. It's going to be half a million. It's going to be more than five years of World War II in 10 or 11 months of real time. He lied about everything and, and, he, and he made fun of disabled people. And he said terrible things about women and, and their looks and everything else. And he was clearly a racist. And I, I don't, we can never forget as a, Jew, as a Jewish person and Randy understands what I mean, it's pounded into our skulls about the Holocaust for a reason. We should never forget who, how many people have died and all of the, the egregious corrupt acts and, 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 and uh, actions of fraud perpetrated on us as a people. Uh, we should never let each other forget that because we're doomed to repeat it if we do. So just let, let Dr. Fauci's comments yesterday be a reminder of that. Another topic that's hard to do in 90 seconds. Um, <laughs> I, I would also like to talk about Dr. Fauci and um, I'm pretty moved by uh, this Hannah Arendt essay I've referenced 500 times. Um, where she's basically the enemy of truth is power. It wasn't obvious to me when I read it, but it becomes increasingly clear. This is the evidence of it. So if you're Donald Trump and Dr. Fauci is out there just talking science, then it's possible with every sentence that he says that some new study, some new finding, some assertion of Dr. Fauci's will undermine what Trump wants to do or has just said, right? Like his power is threatened by science because he can't tell science what to say. He can't make science fall in line, right? So this is where um, Dr. Fauci being out there just saying whatever the science delivers next, right? There he was talking about how the variants of the disease in South Africa and Brazil and England, how they will or won't affect the efficacy of monoclonal antibodies, right? Like this isn't something that's a policy decision. He's just saying, it looks like it'll be pretty effective here because of the cushion effect, blah, blah, blah. He gets to just talk science. Um, that's super valuable and calming to me as a citizen to be like, good, science in the driver's seat. Now, in the NBA, we also have people managing a COVID pandemic and we have no Dr. Fauci. I'm wondering why. 
right? Like I would love to hear their experts. Why is Memphis sidelined for three games? Why are these games okay? Why do we think gameplay is okay, but hugging isn't like put some scientists out there. What we have here is leaks, which is not, is not a lot for accountability. So as we know, Monday was Martin Luther King Jr. Day, and this week we inaugurated the Biden-Harris ticket. Um, and it is my estimation that Martin Luther King Jr. is the finest man that this country has ever produced. Um, and I want to read something from Where Do We Go From Here, which was his fourth book um, out in 67 and his last uh, before he died um, in, in 68. I'm now convinced that the simplest approach will prove to be the most effective. The solution to poverty is to abolish it directly by a now widely discussed matter, the guaranteed income. The curse of poverty has no justification in our age. It is socially as cruel and blind as the practice of cannibalism at the dawn of civilization, when men ate each other because they had not yet learned to take food from the soil or to consume the abundant animal life around them. The time has come for us to civilize ourselves by the total, direct, and immediate abolition of poverty. You know, as we look at what's going on in this excitement around the Biden-Harris ticket and all the good things, as I've said beginning, from the beginning, the work continues and we must hold these people to account. While we're looking at the potential of an impeachment trial for Trump and all these different things are gonna start taking our mind away from what we need to be focusing on, 44, 45 million Americans and counting still living in poverty. And that number is only going to climb as a result of this pandemic we are still in the middle of. Um, let us make sure that we are paying attention to what is right and what we need to be doing and again, thinking of the words of someone like Dr. King, uh, one of the original democratic socialists. You see David's comments? <laughs> <laughs> that, listen, that I always say that MLK weekend is about white people going skiing. That's, that's what it is. <laughs> that's right. Do you have more to say on the subject? I got plenty to say, but we can save it till later. Okay. okay. I'm happy Thank to give you my slide. Thank you. It's pretty important. Uh, so I will piggyback on, on a little bit of what you were okay. saying in, in a way that people probably see. So there's a, Congress, there's a Congresswoman from Georgia uh, who, has, who boasted about uh, a, a filing for impeachment for Joe Biden already. It's now been, it's now it's, it's learned that on Facebook in 2018, she, uh, she thought that the school shooting in Parkland was all an act, it was all made up, same as Sandy Hook that Pelosi and Hillary Clinton are, are negotiating these things to create more of an environment so that they can go after your guns. And she also thought our government perpetrated 9-11. I, I read the book about the 9-11 attacks and everything. It's in my shelf right here, right back there. That, that didn't happen. Uh, we, we have no shot to accomplish things we want to accomplish as a nation with fools like this in office. Uh, I am emailing our congressperson who I've already told him he, he actually was a professor of my students, my kids at uh, school last year. I've already told him he's lost my vote and I'm actively gonna work against him in our next election. He didn't love that. Uh, but I'm emailing him now, like he needs, if he wants to have any shred of credibility, the, the Republicans have to speak up and say, this person cannot represent our party because they're making shit up. And we've had fools for four years, it's time to stop. We're not gonna get rid of all of them, but we need to try because there's some serious shit we have to fix. And we can't do it with fools like this in office. David doesn't curse about politics that much, but he did there. Serious. Shit. I'm obsessed. Okay, here we go. Um, John Hollinger wrote that the NBA is playing too many games. I love this, of course, for my own reasons that we've discussed. Really? But, um, but this is really interesting. So the Wizards Celtics game January 8th was kind of like patient zero for the NBA's string of postponed games. His point is that, like, in the immediate aftermath of that game, both those teams went and played a whole bunch of teams, right? If they'd only played in like pods of groups of six or eight teams, then there wouldn't be that much contact tracing to do. There'd be far fewer games canceled. Um, or if they'd played just fewer games, period. And I'm gonna read here, he says, the first half schedule dramatically failed because it needed to limit the pool of potential opponents and specify multi-game series against each. Instead, maybe it went almost completely in the opposite direction by playing a 72 game schedule, but still having every team play every other home and away. This guarantees a new next opponent for at least 58 of every team's 72 games, even with the occasional two game series. And then I'm gonna to cut to this part. I know what everybody's thinking because they're still gonna make the second half up. They can still do what they want. They can make up the rules. They can make out how long it is. They can change everything. And John has one little line here that's worth keeping in mind. 
save your whining about strength of schedule considerations for another day. The primary consideration here is completing the season in any way possible. Um, we'll see what happens in the second half, but I hope that they don't feel the need without vaccinations for everyone uh, to adhere to anything like this. Love it, because I read that right before we came on. I dropped it at the bottom of the thing. We got to talk about this article. Um, I do love it. I love the beginning where Hollander talks about the sort of fundamental way that like just as humans, we don't understand exponents and what that means, right? Like the idea <laughs> that, okay, like how simple it is for one case to turn into 386 million in literally a matter of a few months. Like that's how this shit works. That's where John casually mentions that he was talking to a physicist friend. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I do love it, right? Because there is something about, and it's a larger point I wanted to talk to you guys about. We have this fear in this society about around math, right? And numbers, whatever, whatever, whatever reason. I don't know why, but we just do. But the inability to sort of comprehend what that is, right? It's think of it like compound interest, but on steroids. It's the same fucking idea. Shit just keeps multiplying because that's how math works. And I think when it comes to the pandemic and the schedule, I mean, Hollinger is so dead on here. Like this second half of the year, I mean, the whole the whole schedule could have easily been, let's just do 15, you know, 15 teams stay here. Screw the other conference. Why does it matter? And we and we make the ability to contact trace simpler because, well, if I'm only playing this the same two teams for 14 games, I know what I know what who I'm looking at. But you could add Phoenix or some faraway team into the mix. Now we make this impossible. And this is what we have we have going on right now. Did you guys watch, um, I was watching the, the day of the insurrection of the Capitol. There were like the sort of pro forma five minute speeches where everyone talks about if they're gonna certify the votes or not. And I was like, this is just incompetent, right? Like no one's gonna change anybody's mind. This is just little performances. It's like a stupid talent show. And it's a boring stupid talent show, right? Like um, this is not debate. This is not the point of assembling physically together to tease out an issue, right? They're not making us smarter with this deliberation, right? Um, it strikes me too with like, whatever the NBA process behind the scenes was to make the schedule, like it's not good, yeah. right? Like there are certain forces, they got TV deals, they got billionaires, they got a bunch of stuff. They got to put it all in the pot. And like it doesn't end up under this kind of stress. They're not very, it hasn't worked out very well, right? This is a, this is a terribly compromised, like I bet you the smartest person in the NBA has a plan that was way different and they just couldn't make it reality, right? Like they, they could just call Erica. Yeah, seriously. Right, and say, all right, here's what we're faced with. What do you recommend? I'd love to see uh, a ten day hi a ten day hiatus. Everyone go back home, hibernate, right? It, it, especially if no one has vaccines at that point. And then we'll, that's when we restart the second part of the schedule. We can do whatever John wrote. I, I read what he wrote, uh, or some other derivative of that. But let's first get everyone to, to zero and hopefully have no positive tests and then restart something simple. Um, I, I, I have no idea what they're going to do. They, they have evidence, right, that we don't have. But like, it might be that the infections are more at home. Yeah, could be. I, I wonder um, how much of the, when they decide to do this. I mean, look, we know that the reason why they sort of force this schedule is because they want 2021, 2022 to be back to normal. For right? sure. That's why we have this and yeah. what it is. For sure. But how much of, you know, cramming the 72 and doing the whole, you got to play each team at least once away and, and once home, how much of that is like what I always say, the worst phrase known to mankind? Well, that's how we've always done it, right? And like, yeah, but that's not smart. Amen. Like, yeah. You know what I mean? Who cares? Like, if, if no you put that are, aside. <laughs> if, if no East team played a West team, who gives a shit? Like, why does that matter? Like, you, you got your games in, yeah. you got a record. Now we can go on and have a playoff. Like, I just don't, I don't get it. And if you're in your little bu team bubble, I mean, it's just like all of our homes, right? Like something risky happens, right? Like someone maybe was exposed or whatever. If you hunker down for 10 days, your chance of spreading it to anybody else is very low. But right. if you can hunker down for five days, still like, you know, still everybody passing tests, everybody asymptomatic. Like, just I feel like, you know, they're playing back to backs with travel in between. Like, that's a big fuck you to people trying to manage COVID, you know? I, I've, as a segue to a segment I want to get to, 
It's as if they asked the studio host at TNT to come up with the COVID <laughs> <Yeah>. protocol. <laughs> very <laughs> very Sha- graceful, David. Very we have Shaq and Ernie and, and folks. <laughs> Shaq and Smith and Ernie and Barkley are the ones deciding the schedule. All right. So it, it, I, is it okay we can talk about this now? Because it's been driving me crazy. Oh yeah, go. So they so yesterday Kenny Smith had some kind of you know soliloquy on what it takes to be a superstar and how Donovan Mitchell isn't there. And then Barkley, uh, honestly, Barkley, what he says, I, I can't remember anymore. It's so silly to me. Um, and, and then after the game was over, and Donovan Mitchell was amazing in the game. The Jazz are the hottest team in the league. They're right there, like tied for first with the two LA teams. And, uh, and Shaq decided to pick that moment to tell Donovan he's not as good as he thinks he is when he was just the best player on the court for maybe the best team in the league right now. And, and uh, I, I had the volume down because, as I've said, I, that's what I do typically. I learned my lesson at halftime that I'm not going to have it on anymore. And I was on a phone call anyway. And, uh, and that when Shaq said the Donovan, I guess he said, I like, like what else are you going to say? Which I thought was beautiful, right? That's now we've had two great moments between Christian Wood and Donovan. Those guys need to be on the show. Uh, like, what are we doing? Why, why do these guys, why are they convinced that there's, they know the game better than all of us and all these guys suck? Well, and why do, you know, fans our age, um, by that, I mean, 25, uh, (laughs) why do they think that in all these kinds of debates, like, you know, the Charles Barkley, Michael Jordan, Shaquille O'Neal character is like a God figure who just dispenses infinite wisdom. And today's young players just need advice, right? Like, I think that I feel it's more convincing the other way. I think if you look at like Donovan Mitchell's bag of tricks and what he's had to learn, right. And like all of his skills, like he should be lecturing, right. Like not to mention Donovan Mitchell has to like navigate media in the times of black lives matter and COVID, right. Like Shaq's never dealt with this degree of, I mean, he's dealt with a lot of stuff. Don't get me wrong. Like, but like the idea that like you can just run the Shaq playbook as a guard in today's NBA and just, boss everybody around like that's not that doesn't work anymore Gerard, that way. Uh, to henry's point Gerard, did you see what kenny smith said to shack about this exact subject no what did kenny say oh i bet you did i bet i just framed the question badly kenny said to shack uh shack is doing what henry's describing he's like just telling big guys what to do and kenny's saying there ain't no big guy watching this that's ever going to do what you did <laughs> right exactly. like no there's no he, he literally looked at the camera and said none of you are making it yeah. There's been, what is the number? 4,500 players play in the NBA yeah. ever? I actually texted yeah. a player that that stat last night. Like, dude, don't get so down on yourself because you didn't play the best game. You're one of 4,500 in the history of the world who have played yeah. the NBA. And, but, but while Kenny was saying this, Gerard, I kept thinking, there ain't no big guy watching this anyway. Right. No high school big guy. They're not watching TNT halftime. No. <laughs> No, I know. Yeah. I've had a bunch of them in my house over the years. They're not watching <laughs> TNT halftime. It's it, it's such a strange thing because, and even the dynamic of the TNT set is also strange. So we know on, on, on the internet, we have this thing called rings culture, right? And this idea that if you have rings, that means you're smarter than everybody else. And it's like, and we all know that stuff all comes down to sometimes literally a matter of luck and the bounce of a ball, right? Like, Kenny Smith having two rings and Barkley having none does not mean that Kenny Smith is smarter than Charles Barkley about basketball, right? Like it just shit happens in this game, right? And in circumstance and all these different things. I just, we talk about it all the time. I wish these guys would talk about basketball in a way that is more than just these silly reductive conversations, right? But again, it's almost like this isn't for us, right? This is for like the casual fan because the casual fan will then jump on Twitter and, and have this a million hour debate about these kinds of things, right? And I feel like it needs to be a happy medium. Not everyone needs to be literally, you know, Nate Duncan and Danny LaRue analyzing every single salary cap thing and like every single side pick and roll action. But you don't need to say, this guy's got 50 rings. This guy's got, like, there needs to be some kind of medium there, right? Like we can talk about the game. And also how does this person rank historically? What do we think about this era compared to that era? Like we can do that, I think. And I actually, I think TNT can lead us. Like to me, the distinctive difference between that, the tenor of that show and Charles Barkley in particular is that almost alone among media heavyweights in basketball, they make fun of themselves. Yes. Um, 
which is something to build on, <laughs> right? Like, like I love that they laugh at themselves. It's the best, it's my favorite thing probably in televised basketball media is that they're, you know, they legitimately don't take themselves so seriously. I was in a lot of meetings at ESPN where basically they were like, well, how come, I mean, this is not the way it was phrased, but it's like, you know, why are they kicking our asses in the ratings? And it's like, well, every time we have a show, it's just people yelling at each other. <laughs> like, it's not nice. It doesn't feel like a good living room to hang out in, right? Like, like you would want it. You really do want to have a beer with them, right? Like, like it would actually be a decent night, I suspect. Um, I have no such suspicion. Very fun night. <laughs> What's that? A yeah. very fun night drinking with those yeah. two. Let me tell they you. wouldn't have to pay for the drinks. Um, wouldn't, you, wouldn't you want, but wouldn't you think the NBA would want to have them <laughs> tell the, the be- rough ass morning <laughs> want them to, to tout the beauty of the game uh then i uh, henry because he's a, a wonderful loving friend reminded me when colin sexton went for 40 something that i had been really excited about him when he was a rookie and and i i told him i did a radio show in cleveland and the djs were great but i got a lot of feedback from people in cleveland saying i'm an idiot for thinking colin sexton was a really talented player i i feel pretty good about what i said about him and and things about Ben Simmons, I, I, I've not I've not been afraid to state my opinion, and I'm I, I thought the Knicks wouldn't be good this year, and now I'm excited to write about them probably next week, Randy. I like what I'm seeing from them. I'm wrong plenty of times. It's hard to predict the future. These guys, all they want to do is talk back to their old days and ridicule everyone. There's no insight to that. There's no wisdom to that. Guys, use your experience and your knowledge of the game, which is considerable, and let us know why you think Christian Wood might be an All Star. Or whatever. I'm not put. I don't mean to put words in their mouth. That's what I do, and you're wrong sometimes. So be wrong. It's okay, right? It's funny when you're wrong. When Barkley predicts the series, they're always wrong. It's it's cute and funny, right? But what they're doing is just mean. Yeah, th- you're right. There is a way that again they can do the funny stuff, right, and also be insightful. Like Charles Barkley can Barkley can say, "Oh, Draymond Green, another triple single," right? And like everyone can laugh about it. But then he can be like, okay, but here's why that triple single is actually really impactful, right? right? Like right. You, you, can, you can joke about that and make fun of the triple single, but then say, okay, here's why it matters. Well, like, I, I think the fundamental structure of sports TV shows is that things matter strictly because of who's in the chair, right? They just have the same fucking set for every show, right? It's just the only thing they can negotiate is like, is can they get a slightly more famous person in this chair? So the whole bet is like, Charles Barkley said it like and that's just not how facts work right that's not how accuracy works right there's nobody who's just generally accurate on all points right like the fact is Charles has done his homework and knows his stuff on some things but he talks it, on all things right, right. Like, that's a job it's a job to be accurate you have to do your fucking homework right yeah. and like so to me like 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 David you would talk about Christian Wood after watching a bunch of video of Christian Wood and not before right <laughs> right like right. Like that's the basics of this job, right? That's like, you wouldn't shoot a three if you didn't practice threes in the old job they used to have, right? Like, like so to me, like, it's not that it's Charles is good at this or bad at this. It's like, just do the things that you are good at, right? Like do your homework and then, and, then tell us. and if you have any homework, shut up. Right, none of us are 25. And so yeah. we're all, with the three of us, are in a, well, you guys are probably more, you're a similar generation, I'm a generation older, but we all watch the game. Henry's got great memories of Portland. I'm sure, Gerard, you were a Knicks fan, I'm guessing. Oh, no, no, no. I was a Lakers fan growing up. Oh, beautiful. So you with me. <laughs> so, so, were you, so were you AC Green? Were you oh, AC yeah. Green? Okay. AC, oh, those are my guys. Yeah, so I, I was Norm Big Nixon game. first. I was Norm Nixon, then AC Green. So, but he, how cool is this? I was the only two Lakers in that era, by the way. I know. <laughs> <laughs> there was, uh, oh, I mean, I, I used to watch, you know. I watched Elgin Bale and Joy West there a little bit too. Uh, how great would it be if these guys would have a segment where uh, who do you, who's he play like? And they had to pick a teammate or a competitor that reminded them of, of a guy they're seeing now, especially not a superstar. That would really be interesting. And it's not hard to find tape. NBA, they own the NBA. They have all the NBA films. Let us know why they play like Bobby Dandridge, right? Or, I mean, even Jeff Hornacek is old for a lot of fans now. It's a way to connect history. It'd be great. I would love to hear their opinions on it. And they'll probably think of some players old school that we wouldn't even think of. Yeah. I would love to see that. That would take some creativity and some analysis and tape watching and all of that. That'd be fun. And you could still drop in the who we play for. Like, cause it would be hilarious. 
you can still do that. And everyone would laugh because it's like, oh yeah, who does he play for? <laughs> yeah. um, I have a quick question for Judy. Um, Judy, are you available for a quick legal question? Legal. It's okay oh, if you're not. I think she is. Looks like she's, here we go. Hey, legal. Um, it just occurred to me. So there's a thing that basketball coaches, David, I think I've, I've even heard him advocate this, which is basically if you commit like 30 fouls in a minute, they're not going to call 30 fouls. So it's like you give yourself permission to play super aggressively, knowing that you'll get, I'm wondering, is there a similar, similar legal principle? I'm asking this because we talk about Trump did like a million impeachable things, yeah. but they're not going to impeach him a million times, right? Like, is there, is there a legal principle of like, you just kind of pick the one easily enforceable thing and <laughs> do you see what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, actually the way that like, the legal system works, you have counts of something, right? So like, and oh, right. all, you can combine all the counts of different um, illegal activities to constitute an even greater crime, right? Like conspiracy mm -hmm. is um, a much graver crime, but the way that it works is you have to have like an amalgamation of a series of crimes that um, together equal a larger crime um so uh, no i think like the way the legal system works it's n my son charlie's very disappointed about this too like, <laughs> if you take 20 cookies you can have 20 counts of theft mm. <laughs> That's awesome. how many cookies can you eat <laughs> judy it was only one theft though that's what tom hanks would argue the character that he played in the Bridge of Spies movie. Have you ever seen that, Judy? I haven't yet. The brilliant, the book's okay. Actually, the movie was better. It's based on a true story. And as, a, as an insurance lawyer, he argues the opposite of what you're trying to do. He tries to make, oh, it's just one act. If you get in a car accident, other things happen. It's just one accident. The law looks at it differently. He's an insurance guy. He was really, it's a, yeah, first of all, it's a great movie. You should watch, yeah. I mean, but also but, like the legal system is very negotiable, right? So you yeah. go in there and you've got like a hundred thousand counts of every kind of thing. And then you negotiate down so that you actually are convicted of, you Something. know, in exchange for cooperation. You've mashed them all together. It's kind of one cookie. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I submit that was one batch of cookies you made, mom. So right. therefore, me stealing these cookies all in one sitting. I am sure what? Charlie's gonna try it. You know? They're not super yeah. ready to try the case. He's like ready. He's like, oh, I do. me and coach. <laughs> well, well, Judy, stay on. I don't mean to hijack your, if you have more to say, Henry, but can we, can we talk about Amanda Gorman? And Henry had some really insightful things yesterday with me on the phone about her. What, what was your, what, what are y'all's thoughts on, on that young lady? I mean, first reaction, I want her outfit. She looked amazing. Second reaction, See, how much could you sell that coat for right now? Oh, a lot of money. Um, I actually, before the inauguration, heard an interview with her on NPR where she was talking about um, having been a poet her entire life and she had a speech impediment. Um, yeah. She started writing at the age of four wow. poetry. Um, and I just remember thinking like, man, like this, she she this was in her bones and yeah. then to see after hearing that and then to see her i'm like oh yes this this was in you the whole time i loved her yeah yeah so I was, she, uh, actually this might tick a little bit with your caa point job but what mm -hmm. i was saying to david on the phone yesterday was like uh the part that felt super electric well everything that thing honestly i'm gonna frame it we're gonna like get that poem put it on the wall amazing right but um but the feeling of it was like we didn't know her before, except for Judy did. But um, but to me, it felt electric, like maybe there's more magic a block from my house right now, yeah. right? Maybe America is full of Amanda Gorman's and it's a beautiful thing to think, right? And this is a little bit like David is always saying, like, you have no idea how many NBA players there are who aren't in the NBA, right? Like, and this is where a little bit like, I, I'm very happy that JLo was there, but it's not an idea. You don't get credit for discovering her. You know what I mean? Like, no, we bring out JLo, right? Like we're politicians. We need to reach Latina audiences. Like this is what we do, right? I'm like, ah, okay, it's fine. That's good. But so much more exciting to have this in, is discovery, right? And that's where like the idea that America is full of talent is would be most exciting to me. And that's, I think actually your CAA point drives a little bit like CAA is a different bit. CAA is more like, no, there's like a hundred stars. 
when we have 80 of them and you're going to give us 10 percent <laughs> right like like they kind of want it to be the j-lo inauguration right i don't know if it's just cia but whereas like the amanda gorman argument is like no we've got people like we're just going to keep scouring the world and and there's so much talent you can't even imagine it oh and but don't forget your other point henry and then and dry it's fair for you to, to chime in uh and that was, we probably got her best effort because she was asked by the yeah. president-elect to do this. That's the That goes back to my whole royal jelly thing. Absolutely. Imagine, Amanda's, listen, no one's questioning anything about her amazing genius, right? In every way, shape, and form. There's others out there that are absolutely not seen. And if they're seen by a high school teacher, great. But if they're seen by Joe, Dr. Joe Biden or Joe, whoever saw Amanda, and then and said, well, you're special, what a feeling that would be. Right, that's the royal jelly on steroids. So, Gerard, what were your thoughts watching it all? So, I I did know her before the before the inauguration. Of course, um, you did. <laughs> you're way above us. I, I believe she is the. Young is she in your house right now? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> she, 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 no, we're on the East Coast. Come on, this is not. She, 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 she already. Uh, at least she's the youngest national poet laureate um, in 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 history. Um, I think that what we want to do here is do more than just sort of, you know, hype on these like moments and they're great. But to your point, there are so many other immensely talented people out there in the world. Um, I want to focus a lot on sort of like the craft of her work, right? I mean, you had to feel something listening to, to her poetry. I mean, it was powerful, right? Like in literally, I don't know, 12 words, right? Condemning Donald Trump while simultaneously saying this is the dawn of a new age, right? I mean, it's that ability is, that's, that's very rare. That's, that's, a, that's a talent. We talk about like someone who's like an organic intellectual. That's a talent that like, you know, some people just got this shit and other people just don't, right? Like, and she certainly has it. I think now what's important is that we continue to you know, and she won't need it now because now she's famous, right? She's now oh, yeah. in that CAA bubble. So anything she writes now or do whatever, not saying she is CAA, I don't know, is going to become the most popular, well-read New York Times bestseller, done, done, done. So she's already in that new stratosphere now. How do we now help all the other Amanda Gormans out there and discover them and find them, right? What is our plan for that? Because we're very good in America at, oh, we, here's our one, we got them, and now they're a star, right? That's the Barack Obama syndrome, right? It's like, here, look, we, we found one. Here it is, perfect. Everything's good. And no, it's not. Like, there's so much more to be done. And what are we doing to make those pathways possible for others? To so, draw, what do you, like, Joe Biden took a very particular approach to, like, unity and healing. All the people of color. <laughs> so, and, and her custom poem for the day you know, tried a very careful line, but even though she's someone, I saw the thing where she said that her mom taught her her Miranda rights when she was a child, so that she would know them. She could have put that in the poem, right? But she didn't. This was like this. This was like she she mustered, she stitched together a unity message <laughs> despite everything. Well, how did that how did that grab you? She did what she had to do, right? Like that, that's the thing when you are black or a person of color and you are now on this stage there is a certain amount of militarism, militarism that you can have and a certain amount you can and you have to also know your audience and when and where and look ultimately if we're trying to make the world first, first start with america we're trying to make america a better place you need that quote-unquote unifying message and even with everyone being happy that Trump's out of office and all that stuff. You still can't come up here on inauguration day raising no black power. No, 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 my friends. That's still not gonna play well. You still have to, how do I get everyone to like this message? So you say it without saying it, right? And that's what she did. And that's what you have to do. The, the, uh -huh. network, the network that shows, the NFL, NFL football is the most popular sport in America. Their, their main network, Fox, I think there's two that cover it, but Fox does the NFC, which is typically the better conference. On their, on their nighttime news channels, which I've now blocked. I've blocked Fox from all four of my office TVs. I never want to look at it again. Uh, they, were, they were basically uh, making an equivalency comment on the attempted murderous coup for control of the White House to the outbreak the other day in Portland, Seattle, uh, I think Portland, at the Democratic headquarters, where I'm not even sure exactly what happened. Although I, there was no government people at risk of being murdered, 
and having a, an election overturned, but they were making that as if the, 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 it was a false equivalency to the whole thing. That is why Amanda had to do what she did. There's a reason why my, my grandfather as a dentist had to have a Christmas tree. He's a Jewish guy. My, I grew up for my first eight years of the Christmas tree. There was that assimilation factor. How do we all get along? That's what minorities have to do. And that's what blacks have had to do in America for too goddamn long. And, and, then to, and I'm glad that Gerard didn't criticize her, which of course you wouldn't, because she, she has to get her message out or no one's listening. It's not her job to, to, be, to, to yell at people. She's allowed to do what she wants to do. And she's a poet and we saw her talent. But there's like a, a, a temperature check on our nation, right? Which is like, um, I think it matters if people watch her speak and think, oh, that's what she had to say to get this gig versus like, she speaks for me. She's mm -hmm. addressing the problems that she's, she's, she's mending the tears in my heart, right? Like they're not exactly the same thing, right? So right. like, I think if like, another thing that happens is people can say, oh, well, like we heard from Amanda Gorman, so we're good, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. it's like, ah, she was a little more subtle than that. <laughs> you know, like, and, and I think to your point, Henry, like, obviously <laughs> I haven't polled every black person in America. Do but, it, get on it, Gerard, when's the meeting? <laughs> <laughs> but from my sampling of, of, you know, whether it be Twitter to people I've talked to, like we all, and by we meaning black people, we all got it, right? Because again, we know what it means when you're on that stage and what it is you have to be able to do, right? And I don't know how that works if, like, before she goes up there, it has to be proved by somebody. I, maybe, maybe not. Oh, I, hell yeah. Right? Like, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure someone has to yeah, at least look sure. it over before you say it. So, you know, she couldn't quite come out and be like, but couple that with Joe Biden saying, you know, denouncing white supremacy, right? Like, so he can say that, right, as the president and as a it's white saying, man, yeah. that works. Cool. Yeah. Then I'll just follow up with saying the same thing, but not saying it. Right. So yeah, I'm sorry to belabor this point. So um, when they started having in the vowel section of the New York Times, they started having gay couples. Right. On that day, like we have friends who are like that. Like the clouds parted that day. Right. That was a big step forward. Right. David's uncle has a Christmas tree in his office waiting room. Like it doesn't heal it's an accommodation right like right so it's just like where i'm trying to i was just trying to tease out like is this a healing is she like mm -hmm. like look we bust through or is this like no 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 like you know <laughs> like i did what i had to do right i, I, I we won't I, all this say on this I did what i had to though, do but. but i think it was also like there is a point we need to make here and i think she made it right like yeah, yeah. It, w w without question but you know that's but that is the challenge of building any kind of coalition right because that's ultimately what we're trying to do we want to be exactly better right. how do we build a coalition well david thorpe's opinions about how a coalition should look are going to be different than how my opinions of a coalition look but we have if we all want the best thing in the end well yeah. what's something that's going to get both of us to be like okay we're doing this and that's how messages have to be delivered that's right that's we're, right we're, well my, my wife and i watch in the west wing uh and everyone every time i tell people that uh they're like, oh, I'm so jealous. Because it is, first of all, they used to make a lot of shows back in the day. There's 20 some odd episodes a year. We're on, we're halfway through season one. We have, we're going to, it's going to take years. Um, but uh, it's interesting. It's just 20 years ago how, you know, gay marriage was, I mean, I, I believe President Obama and Hillary Clinton used to not be for gay marriage, right? There, there is an evolution that's allowed to occur as a society. As I say all the time about players, they're allowed to grow up. Coaches too can get better. They can grow up. As a society, we can grow up too. We need the Amanda Gormans. Uh, uh, it's hard to deny her her beauty as a person, her talent. It's hard to deny that. If you deny it, you've really got problems. There's real problems there. Uh, uh, you don't have to agree with her opinion as so necessarily to realize you're in the presence of something really special. And, and we need to evolve. That's what we need to do. And there's engines required for that. So she's a spark, but those, the three of us and Judy and others, we can be an engine. That's why we try to do this show. We want to be an engine for change. Amen. Um, all right. So we have some other topics here. Uh, you guys can pick. So do we want to talk about uh, Sean Marion? Do we want to talk about the Mavericks defense? Or do we want to talk about um, something else? Let's start with Sean Marion, I think. Okay. Let's go. I didn't realize that was the topic. Did I throw it on there? 
No, no, I, I threw so it did. at the bottom. Because oh, yeah. I tweeted about it. Yeah. So here's what I want to say about that, just straight up. Like, I always enjoy when athletes or NBA, let's talk about the NBA, that's what we cover, talk to <laughs> other NBA guys, because there is a level of candidness that they give their peers that they don't give people like Henry and I. So right? true, yeah. Because we're going to twist their words or whatever the hell we're, we're going to do. Um, so I appreciated that the, the week before, um, Tim Duncan was on the pod and they talked about, cause Roger was on that son's team and you know, how we're going to beat you guys. And, you know, Duncan basically saying, look, we knew that Nash and Amar were going to do their thing and that's fine. It was just the rest of you guys aren't doing shit. And if those, and if those playoffs sort of, if you remember those series, that's kind of how it worked, right? Nash and Amari, you know, kind of were fine, but there was really no, nobody else doing anything relevant. And, and in this piece, you know, uh, Marion came out and said, you know, you were predictable, right? Like that was, that was what opponents said against them. And we talk about all the time, how regular season and playoff basketball are different, right? Like let's look no further than the Milwaukee Bucks. The last two seasons, maybe three, they've had the best record in the league, but for whatever reason, whatever they do in September through April is one thing, but what they do April through June doesn't translate for whatever reason. Right. And there is some, there is some disconnect there, right? Or some change in how the basketball is different, right? So I, I, I think there is, there is, I enjoy when players do that because I think there is, there is some truth to things that they say when they talk with their peers versus when they talk to people like us. And so Sean Marion was super mad and um, couldn't help. He did, he did, he, he was kind of mad because he scored 25 points in the first half of one game. and then He, he didn't, the but, he didn't, by the way, I looked it up, but go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Everything he said pretty much was wrong, but go ahead, Henry. Um, yeah, it felt I, like I, I, I do like you said. I just love it. Like just talk. Like, like Sean Murray, someone who's mostly been in his shell, right, in private, not sharing these thoughts, and I don't want to play a part in like beating him up for coming out of a shell, right? It's like no, let's have these have, talk to Raja Bell about this stuff in public, please. Like it's mm -hmm. great. Um, but the the and he but he he didn't say Mike D'Antoni's name, but he like starkly blamed the Suns coaches for not doing the right things in the second half of this right. game. Blah, blah, blah. Um, that's where I was like, okay, it, number one, they did run the best offense in the history of the world at that time. Like, so every, it's a game of mistakes. As David points out, maybe they've made mistakes, but they made fewer mistakes than every other offense ever. Right. And I don't think like I could make different arguments about them losing in the playoffs. Like one is, uh, it's very random, a seven game series, right? Like it, maybe it's a stylistic difference and there is evidence for sure, Drudge, to support your point that like this, you can't just do the same, predictability is, is hammered more in the playoffs than in the regular season. Um, but, uh, but man, like we just had like seven games into this NBA season, nobody knew who the best team was because there's randomness, right? It's just like, there's only seven games. Like, and you can lose a seven game series in four games, right? Like. And then someone gets hurt, whatever. Also, I think they had a problem, which was I think that Steve Nash played hard 82 games, which I think is actually a stupid strategy. <laughs> like, I think he would have a wreck by the time he got to the play. So in, in addition to, you know, he probably should have sat 20 games, right? But he showed up tired and then the Spurs got to wear him out, right? And then the Spurs got to just make him solve every problem. Like, well, he might have done that 10 games into the year, okay, but it didn't work this time. Well, and the game before, we're talking about game six. In game five, the, Boris and Stoudemire were suspended. So that required even more energy from They were Matt, talking right? about the second time, right? Not, not the series where they got suspended. They were talking about he was talking the following year. Following year. Marion's point was that they were better the following, following year. year. Yeah. Oh, but okay. I'm, yeah, I'm just saying when he was talking about he scored 25 in the first half and they made no adjustments, he only had 20. And he had 11 shots in the first half two free throws, five in the second half, two free throws. And his argument about no adjustments, he's ignoring that the other team made an adjustment. They clearly were a little more worried about Sean Marion. And I don't think all year Phoenix ran a lot of stuff for Sean. Sean made his money on that offense that you're describing. Yeah. He could play within the gaps of, of what they did. He was never a great three-point shooter. He was okay, better than you thought he would be because his form was bad. But – the, the, when he acts as if uh, uh, the Spurs is something special about solving the pick and roll with just two guys, that is what a lot of teams choose to do. You need the personnel to be able to do it. 
And over the course of an 82-game season, very few teams can. The Spurs could, to some degree anyway. It was still wasn't like they blew them out every game. Uh, and then when, when, when Marion really got me upset when he said, you can't teach instinct. And this then, is right. I know that I said that. Like, oh, no. oh, David's not going to like that at all. Or, or was it anticipation you can't teach? Is that what he said? No, he said instinct. Okay. Yeah, he said you can't teach instinct. And I just, you know, as a father, yeah, you can. Because a kid's instinct would get him killed 85 times a day, right? Or we'd all be enormously fat because who doesn't like looking at donuts and candy corn and whatever? <laughs> <laughs> no, we all we all have to, and I love drinking, but I have one or two drinks a week, maybe, right? I wish I could do it every day, all day, but I know I can't. But my instinct is to keep doing it, right? So yeah, now I have a new instinct, which is to avoid that kind of stuff. But mostly it comes down to, and this is what you're going to laugh when I say this, it's the same thing Jerome was talking about Draymond Green, okay? I, and I love Draymond for a million different reasons, but what got him thrown out of the game, and it was wrong that the ref did that, he just got, he was mad at himself, he fucked up. And he projected his anger, which is a very classic defense mechanism, on Weissman. And I believe even Henry or, or Dry, you put in the quotes, Weissman was just trying to post up. <laughs> he went through a bad pass. And he yelled at him for it, which is what old guys do all the time to young guys. Like we do as parents, they yell at the kid when we're the ones who screwed up. That's all that really happened. Sean it's, it's Shaq talking last... to Donovan Mitchell. Huh? <laughs> it's Shaq talking to Donovan Mitchell. Right, right. Same thing. Yeah. Right. It's, it's a, so Sean Murray's just mad you lost. Dude, it happens. You got yeah. beat by a great team. That's the way it is. And that doesn't mean Mike couldn't have made better adjustments. He didn't make them all year because they had the best offense we had ever seen. And it worked that way. And Henry's right. If you want to really fault D'Antoni, fault him for letting Nash play. And Mike does this all the time. He overplay. A lot of people in his generation are doing that. Mm. Stan Van Gundy feels the same way. Tom Thibodeau, the same way. They overplay their guys. Even when they're up 20 with three to play. I don't get that. Uh, I never did. Mike Krzyzewski does it too at Duke back when they were actually yeah. winning games by 20 points. They don't do that anymore. Uh, it makes no sense. You can criticize them for that. But, but don't act as if, uh, uh, you, you know, I feel like you, you, you bit the hand that, that paid you the money that you have in the bank right now. There because was a Sean little Mary bit. was not a great player in every system. Trust me. He's, I mean, but he was great. Like, and it's really, you had to work really hard to be Sean Marion and For he sure. defended everybody he had to defend and whatever. And, I, and to me, there was a little bit of like, um, you know, if you read the book, um, seven seconds or less, yeah. or, or frankly, like, um, well, I don't want to get into how I know this, but like, but, but like one of the conditions of like keeping Sean happy was a, a, a long-term challenge for that team, yeah. right? Sean was a super important part of the team and needed to hear Mike D'Antoni say frequently that he was the MVP. Like, if you go back and look, like they would say all the time, Sean Murray, he's like the MVP. He should be the MVP. We got to get him MVP. And like, it's the cost of doing business. Like, and, and I felt a little bit like, yeah, no, I, yeah, I, yeah, Sean, you killed it, man. <laughs> like, you killed it. Like, we, we didn't have to get you the ball in position. Like, we just didn't, like, that wasn't what we had to do. Like, that wasn't the job. Like, we should get Amin to talk about this. Amin was there. Like, oh, yeah. I bet Amin has a million stories. And, and he's un unencumbered now. So he might let all the stories go. Was yeah. he ever really encumbered, <laughs> though? <laughs> uh, all right. We want to talk Mavericks and math before we, while we still can, Henry, right? Why don't you, you set it up? Uh, this is a, actually, to be honest, let's scrap that. Can we talk one more? I want to talk a little more Draymond really fast. Um, oh, sure. Love so, that. Uh, on ESPN.com, there's an article about Jermaine Green uh, getting tossed out of the game for yelling at David's favorite rookie. Um, Steph Curry said, it's pretty self-explanatory. He's been very vocal with James. I know he'd already gotten a tech early in the game and obviously mindful of that. He was just talking to his teammate. The refs got confused. I don't know what the rules are in that situation, but it's pretty clear who he's talking to. I don't know if you can take it back in the moment, but it was pretty glaring that he was talking to his own teammate and kind of unfortunate that it got confused. So move on. And then... Um, Weissman says that uh, Weissman acknowledged after Thursday's game that he messed up on the play, which led to the green turnover, really just because I was trying to get a post up and Draymond threw it too early in just one of those moments where he was like, catch the ball or something like that. But that's all really, I don't understand the situation, like why the ref did that. I guess it's basketball, but I was confused myself as well. That was kind of weird. That was a weird moment. So part of me was like, oh, like I hope that Draymond Green doesn't, like make it unfun for James Weissman to go to work. <laughs> he he yelled at him again in the Spurs game too. Yeah, and it was and it wasn't Draymond threw a terrible pass and instead of getting back on defense, he yelled at James Weissman. 
Uh, I think I think it's a insightful point, Henry. I don't get that sense now. Watch, I've watched the last yeah. two games, but um, it's possible. I I tell you, I tell you what it might happen when Draymond Green's averaging three points a game come March, and Weissman is starting to they move James Weissman. I may write an article about this. They have changed their offense a little bit, and they let him play near the rim more. He gets a lot more dunks because of it. Less responsibility. It, it's working for them to some degree. It wasn't working great against the Knicks last night. Uh, if all of a sudden Weiss was starting to feel himself a little bit, then he's going to say, listen, old man, you can't fucking score. <laughs> James Weiss was already putting up historic numbers for 19 year olds. The only guy that's done better than him is Dwight. Yeah. Who's a first ballot hall of famer, in my opinion. That, that, you know, that's perfect. He's being <laughs> humble now. Weissman's being humble now. And he, and he should listen to Draymond, especially defensively. But the Warriors need more to Draymond Green, not James Weissman. Judio, Judy was just playing the last couple of clips there that yeah. we're kind of getting that first. And there are the thing about Twitter and all this stuff is right. The only things that get all the engagement are the ones where Draymond's yelling, right? Because that's for, that's what we want to see. But those last two ones were literally where he's like, "Okay, no, no, on this play, here's what I want, like you know." And it's much more of a teaching moment, right? Like it's he's yeah. softer here, right? He's not screaming at him. Like there, are, it's like Draymond does all of those things. That right? was really good. The I watched one, it live. It was really and, good. And this one where he wasn't playing yet, and he's showing him, look, if you slide like this, here's how you can get in this position better. Like, those are the moments, and again, because Wiseman didn't play summer league, because he only played three college games, right. that's invaluable stuff that he's getting there from Tramon, which is going to be helpful as he continues to get better throughout his rookie season. And Weissman, Weissman portrays someone who looks like he wants to be coached. That may not always be the case, but he acts as if he wants it. Some players, you can tell, leave that dude alone, he doesn't want it. He wants it. I just wouldn't over bet on that, right? Yeah, like, I agree. Like, it just feels like, like James Weston might go to a nightclub one day and he doesn't want to be the one who's like, oh, you're the one who everybody advises. Like, <laughs> you're the learner. Like, he's a fucking man. You know what I mean? Like, he's right. an adult. Like, well, Steve like, Kerr needs to say what I say, which is, Draymond, it's great that you're so interested in mentoring James, but can you fucking score more than three points a game, please? <laughs> well, like, it's like, we could like, use it's you like, too. You don't want to be everybody's hobby. Right. Like you don't want to be like, you know, everybody, James needs help. Like he speaks Mandarin. He's really smart. Like right, exactly. Like, like, yeah. Like, yeah. Like, and he jumps to 13 feet. I think I have yeah, a picture yeah. actually Judy yeah. on there. I might, I might have a picture of him jumping 12. He's a, he's at the square. I think it's on the bottom. Um, uh, yeah. Look at where he's catching the ball. No, that is, that's just, <laughs> there's, you know, there's 12 humans on the planet that could even touch the ball that high. He caught it and dunked it. Like, this is really hard to do. Uh, the game is really fast for him. Uh, it, it, you know, he's my son's age. And my son's telling me how fast the ACC is for him. He's playing against, I talked to him last night. He had, a, he had, he found one of his best scrimmages of all that he's ever had. But he admitted the game is still really fast for me. And my son played high level high school basketball in AAU. But it's hard in the ACC for a 19 year old. This guy's in the NBA. It's going to take, and he's at a position that's super, super challenging at that spot because every mistake is definitely a dunk or a foul yeah um yeah, yeah i like what henry said he speaks mandarin he's a grown man he's gonna be fine yeah and steph and steve kerr has a job too you know Tramon. he does yeah, yeah he Just does out a little bit curve it a little bit please uh henry you know something that you always talk about um and we're proponents of obviously is injury and not playing a lot of minutes and just being smart about it um because when coach said the game's fast for him well someone who the game is not fast for um, it's in slow mo is Kevin Durant, and what has me very nervous right now is that he's looking like, Well, oh, Kevin Durant, like, you sure you didn't kill his injury? He looks fine. That's making me extremely nervous because, as we know, Mike D'Antoni, even though he's only the assistant head coach, whatever the hell he is, and Nash played all his minutes, I'm like, Are you guys paying attention, like, and monitoring him as well as you should? 50 minutes in a double overtime game, I thought the same thing. I don't know if that's really a good idea. <laughs> I know they, they told me, they said this morning, he's questionable. Um, Sorry, Jerry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it was probably me. <laughs> I said it a few times too. Gerard, uh, he's not playing tonight, you tweeted, right? Well, he's, he's questionable. You know, it's, it's questionable because they have a back-to-back. -back. First night tonight is Cleveland tomorrow against Miami. I mean, I, he's not playing both those games. If they're smart, like, hell no. And he's not playing more than 32 minutes tonight, if it were me, but... Apparently, uh, I don't we'll know. have to see. Right? At least they're mindful of it if he's questionable. Are they mindful of 50 minutes in a double overtime game? Doesn't sound very mindful. What do you think, Henry? 
Yeah, I'm with you. Um, I mean, <laughs> this is just like the thing about Dr. Fauci. Like, if you're going to let science drive, then the coach will be in the driver's seat, right? Like, it's a choice. Like, but if science drives, then it doesn't, I mean, it couldn't look like this. There aren't humans who are good at this. Yeah, no. You're asking for trouble, right? Yeah. yeah. They play, so who do they play tonight, Gerard? They play tonight, and then they play Miami tomorrow night. Oh, okay. That's their back-to-back, yeah. So I'm going to watch the Knicks over the weekend uh, for our, our Nick fan out there. And there's there's a good number of them. They should be – I don't know how it's time to be. I need to, I need to break it down a little bit more. I'll, I'll see what I see. Um, but I know they had a big win at Golden State. Golden State did not play well. Steve Kerr, I think, was the maddest he's been all year last night. So we'll see what it looked like. Shouts to the Knicks. 500, baby. Woo! <laughs> yeah, just out of the kindness of our hearts, we're only writing about the Knicks when they're not terrible. That's by design. Like, we're trying to be nice. We're trying to – <laughs> RJ Barrett had a career high 28 points. Yeah, there you go. All right, everybody have a good weekend. Uh, we will see you on Monday. Thank you, David. Thank Be you. Be safe. Judy.